going to be treated to a discussion about uh, long-term challenges in the contemporary seascape. I'm not going to take too much of the time for discussion through introductions. All of the speaker's full biographies are available in your conference folders. Uh, I will <clears throat> help put a face to a name for each of the panelists in the order in which they will appear. First, I'm delighted to introduce my friend and colleague, Commander Jonathan G. Odom, who's a military professor at DKI, DKI ABCSS and an expert on the law of the sea and the legal framework of contribution to international security more broadly. Second, we're going to be addressed by Major General Retired Munir Brzezman, who's the President and CEO of the Bangladesh Institute for Peace and Security Studies in Dhaka. He's going to be talking to us about climate change and the challenge that presents for all of us in the coming decades. And last, we're going to hear from Mr. Roger Baker, who's the Vice President of Strategic Intelligence and Asia-Pacific Analysis at Stratford. Commander Odo, the floor is yours.
But on the other side, you hear about instrumental and phrases that are used to describe the instrumental use of law, rule by law, uh, or law related political warfare, or in the Chinese military doctrine, the phrase, the concept of legal warfare, using the law as a weapon. And then a lot of academics, particularly U.S. Uh, legal academics, have, have talked a lot in the past 15 years since the September 11th attacks about lawfare. Uh, they've attempted to define it using the law as a weapon of war, or using the law uh, to achieve uh, objectives, military objectives. So those, all those phrases themselves can in some way be rhetoric. And so it begs the question, like the old cliche about terrorism, is one nation's lawfare simply another nation's application of law or another nation's rules-based approach? I would argue that, that they are different. And I would offer to you this morning that there's often a way to, to tell the difference. I'll do that by providing you with two concepts, two images that hopefully will stick in your mind after you leave this conference. First, diamonds. I don't know about, right? And second, red dead. <laughs> so you ask yourself, Odin, why are you talking about diamonds and red dead? Because I know most of you are not lawyers. And I'm not going to talk about a whole lot of rules of law, but I am going to talk about things that we can relate to. So with diamonds, how many of you raise your hand if you've ever purchased a diamond? Raise your hand. Okay, see? Exactly. So, one of my first experiences in the Navy, my first duty station was Yokosuka, Japan, and I was deciding to, to uh, propose to my now wife, this was 20 years ago, and I decided to go up to Genza, one of the most expensive shopping areas in the world, I think, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the Tiffany's there, and I was looking at the diamond rings and Tiffany's. What a naive young officer I was. Uh, because what we know is that not all diamonds are created equal, are they? The diamond industry, fortunately, has provided us with four C's of what makes the diamonds at Tiffany's a heck of a lot more expensive than the diamonds that I purchased. So carrot, color, clarity, and cut and grade, right? Fortunately, the four C's. What I would offer you today is that there are four characteristics of the rules-based international order, each of which help to preserve that order. So it's not specific rules of law, but rather characteristics of the international legal regime that help to preserve that order. And fortunately, they all start with the letter C. The first one is construction. International law and the rules-based order expects us to construe and interpret the law as it was intended to mean. So, for example, there is a actual treaty about treaties. <laughs> The Vienna Law of uh, Treaties, the Convention of Law of Treaties, lays out all of the rules of treaty interpretation. And the basic rule is that you are supposed to use the ordinary meaning, in good faith, of the terms of the treaty in their context. And if there's ambiguity in those terms, then you're allowed to use supplementary means like uh, the negotiating history of the Convention. So as a result, a number of treaties, such as the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, the Collision, Regula Reg Collision Regulations Convention, uh, Safety of Life at Sea Convention, all of those were painstakingly and methodically negotiated by many of our nations over a period of years. The Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated for 10 years. Over 100 nations were involved. The United States, most nations are parties. The United States is not, but we view most of it as reflecting customary law. And so when those treaties are negotiated in such depth and such extent, then we need to respect that law. And the way, one of the ways we do is we use those rules of treaty interpretation to properly interpret that treaty. The second C is clarity. That is, nations should be clear in their policy positions, and they should provide clear legal uh, rationale for legal justifications for those policy positions. And so in, a, in these disputes, a number of these disputes that Carrie may mention in her uh, initial remarks, nations haven't perfectly clarified their positions. And so how can you reduce areas of dispute until you know what each nation's position is and what its basis under established international law is? Okay. The 
full third characteristic of the international rules-based order is conformity. And that is, once a nation joins a treaty, it is expected to conform its national laws to that treaty. So national law in that situation does not trump international law. The nation can decide whether it wants to join that treaty, but once it joins, it has an obligation to conform its laws. And we see that in a couple of ways in the maritime context. One of the examples is maritime claims of a coastal state. Admiral McDonald made reference to how the Law of the Sea Convention reflects a balance of interests between coastal states and user states. And so when it comes to a coastal state making its maritime claims of zones off of its coast, it needs to make sure that those maritime claims conform to the Law of the Sea Convention. We look at the other way that uh, conforming to international law includes making sure that, that it's effectively, international law is effectively implemented in a nation's national laws. An example of that is the collision regulations. I'll give you an example. The U.S. government, we join the collision regulations as a convention. We are a party, and we have effectively implemented it within our national system. That is, we've made it a part of national law. If our Navy, if our Coast Guard, if our private commercial vessels don't comply with the collision regulations, then that's not some ethereal violation of international law. That's a violation of U.S. national law. And I'm sure many of your nations have done that. And fourth and finally is consistency. <laughs> Rules-based international norm, uh, order expects nations to behave consistently. If you take the same situation and move it to another location in the world, you're expected to operate in the same manner. A perfect example of that is the U.S. perspective on uh, military activities in the EEZ or the freedom of navigation proportions. You saw last September, not far from here, Chinese vessels were transiting through the U.S. territorial seas near the Aleutian Islands. The U.S. government was asked to comment on that, and they said, that's China's freedom under international law to do that. We were the coastal state, but yet we respected that right of other nations. Flashback two more years to 2014 during the RIMPAC exercise in Hawaii. Uh, there were five Chinese vessels at the Pacific uh, exercise, four of which were invited. The fifth was an intelligence collection vessel. Admiral Locklear, then the commander of the Pacific Command, was asked to comment on this, and he's another Southern gentleman like myself, and said, well, it just means to me that the debate is over. And what he was saying was that that freedom of navigation is a global freedom, and it applies to every nation and every part of the world. So with those four C's, it still takes us to that situation of uh, legal rhetoric and the challenge that that poses. Legal meaning of the law, rhetoric meaning a, uh, the art of speaking or writing effectively. So if you combine the two, here's my definition that I offer to you. And that is the assemblage of law related clauses or language to make a political argument. Now you're still saying, oh, you haven't helped me any. How do I figure this out? And that's where we talk about rednecks. So, how many of you have heard of comedian Jeff Foxworthy? Raise your hand. Yes, I know even a lot of the Canadians. There's one good thing about the U.S. that we, and U.S. and Canada do, is we export some of our pop culture, right? So, I'm fortunate to frequently watch uh, home shopping, or home uh, uh, purchase shows that were filmed in Toronto that are on our Home Garden television channel. But likewise, I know that many of you are familiar with, in Canada, with Jeff Foxworthy and his humor, because he's done uh, comedy uh, routines here in Canada. And in fact, I found one website that was, you might be a Canadian hit. But one of the things that Jeff Foxworthy is famous for is a, a comedy routine that talks about, you might be a redneck hit, right? And so he gives examples in, if, if you uh, have ever broken your tooth while opening a beer bottle, you might be a redneck hit. He says, if you've, if you've ever uh, mowed your lawn and found a car, you might be a redneck. And he says if you, if all of your children's middle name is Elvis, then you might be a redneck. And for those of you who are not familiar with rednecks, it's one of those kind of things that I think each of our nations have, is that friendly joking between rural and city people, right? So the rural people are often, some of them are often first with rednecks. So that's what we're talking about here, for those who are less familiar with U.S. pop culture. So what I would offer to you is, uh, instead, you might be legal rhetoric. 
and I will provide a top ten list to determine, to, to determine and provide practical examples of whether you might be legal red or If you are written solely by a nation's political and policy officials without any legal review or legal advice, you might be legal red That That's not for me advertising that you all need to hire more lawyers. But rather, lawyers bring a certain skill set to the table and a certain mindset of applying the rules of law to the facts of the situation. That's what I'm getting at. If the only international court you are submitted to is the world of court of public opinion, then you might be legal rhetoric. And what I'm getting at there is, if you feel like you only have to talk in short sound bites about the law, uh, and you don't have to defend it further, then that might indicate that it's legal rhetoric. If you twist the ordinary meaning of the terms of the treaty, then you might be legal rhetoric. If you take the terms of the treaty out of context, a perfect example of that, I know that some nations that disagree with the freedom to conduct military activities in the EEC will say that violates the peaceful use clause of the treaty, or the peaceful uh, purposes clause of the treaty. But when you go to the treaty itself and look, that clause applies to everywhere, including the high seas. So does that say you can't conduct military activities in the high seas? No. But if someone takes that clause out of context, then you might think that, that they were making a strong legal argument, but in fact they were engaged in legal rhetoric. Number six, if you ignore the legitimate supplier means, the negotiating history, there are a number of things that if you look at the law of the sea convention negotiations that were clearly intended by the parties. And so as a result, if you ignore that and you try to argue things that were contrary to that history, then that's potentially legal rhetoric. Number five, if you explain a position by only tweet size conclusions, or what I call the practice of law by bumper sticker, uh, you might be legal rhetoric. If you repeatedly keep a public position, policy position and its legal rationale ambiguous after repeated requests to clarify, you might be legal rhetoric. If you refer solely to your nation's laws as the basis for declaring another nation's law, activities unlawful, and those laws don't conform to international law. You might be legal rhetoric. If you provide one rationale to domestic audiences and another rationale to international audiences, that's also a potential indicator that you might be legal rhetoric. And lastly, if you provide a legal position for one international situation in one location, but a similar situation in a different location, you also might be legal rhetoric. So I've tried to inject a little humor, a little creativity into this, and I think one of the, the key things is, is that this is a serious matter, right? That we, every nation, I, I, in fact, I'm not aware of a nation openly saying uh, we disrespect international law or we violate international law. So everyone wants to be on the side of the law. It's just a matter of making sure, we talked about the maritime security challenges for this conference. And one of the challenges is that we, Make sure we challenge other nations to follow the rules of law and to that we dig, dive deeper beyond the legal rhetoric. Admiral Willard, our uh, former boss at U.S. Pacific Command, he also often talked about mature dialogues and immature dialogues. And he said the difference between a mature dialogue and an immature dialogue is an immature dialogue is where you just repeat the same talking points back and forth across the table over a series of meetings. And an image, uh, excuse me, a mature dialogue is where you move beyond those talking points and dive a little deeper in the conversation. And I think that's where you can make progress. And so, as we learned at the Asia Pacific Center, it's very important primacy and recency. You start out and you close in the same fashion. Repetition is the key to education. And so I leave you with one image that I didn't think would be possible to bring diamonds and rednecks together. And that is a wedding. <laughs> so, with that, that concludes my remarks, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, taking us well beyond the usual confines of the legal discussion and short exploration. Uh, very unique. So, now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, who will be addressing a different kind of long term challenge climate change. General, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning.
morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me here to speak this morning. What I'm going to do over the next couple of minutes, speak to you about the changing climate and what significance it has for the maritime space. In the presentation that I have, I'm going to use it selectively so that the chair doesn't have a chance to use either the unicorn or the red card. So please have a look at the screen to see the rest of the presentation. It is needless to say, as Admiral in the beginning said in the morning, that the maritime space is vital for the trade and economy, and a significant portion of our global economy and trade moves through the maritime space, and it is $1.5 trillion worth of goods that we ship through the maritime space. Our energy resources are either dependent on movement of the, through the maritime space or we are sourcing our energy from the maritime space. So for both causes, the maritime space is vital to our energy security. It is also an area that has, for ages and centuries has provided us a link between people to people in various countries and continents. So it is vital to our communication as people, as civilization, and as countries. It is, of course, people in Inform will understand that it is vitally important for geopolitics and military, as the space that commands the space for the military and the naval power is vital to the geopolitics and the politics of the world. So one of the effects that we see in this critically important space that we are talking about, the maritime domain, First of all, the melting of the ice caps. There are several impacts that we see, but for the paucity of time, I'll touch on the, some of the key ones only. The ice caps at the north of the South Pole is melting at a space and speed which has never been seen before. The Arctic is becoming increasingly navigable with its consequences. We also see, due to the melting of the ice caps, a rise in the sea levels in all around the world. Therefore, we might be seeing the extinction of some of the smaller species and its consequences. We are certainly seeing the rise of the sea level, and the rise of the sea level is happening due to a number of causes. The melting of the ice caps, the global warming, and due to these causes, the sea level that is rising will take away much of the lower spaces of the earth that we have habitate today. Many countries that are low-lying will either diminish or will completely vanish. My own country, Bangladesh, for example, will lose 20% of its land mass, which is a fairly limited land mass, inhabited by a very large portion of the global humanity, will lose 20% of its land mass to the sea by the year 2050. We also see a change in the ocean temperature due to the climate change and the temperature of the ocean is rising. The rise of the ocean temperature can cause methane hydrate to melt, leading to increase in methane gas, which in turn will increase the global temperature. So the consequences have interlinkages. And the consequences also what has what I term as the consequences of the consequences. So we, we will be seeing a series of consequences that we have being caused by the global warming causes in the maritime space. We are now seeing a process of coral bleaching, and the coral bleaching in the ocean, uh, due to the rise of ocean temperature, the salinity and the sedimentation have definite and very negative effect on the marine life that we know today. As Admiral mentioned in the morning again, we are seeing the spectra of an acidic ocean. Due to the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the world's oceans are 30% more acidic today than before the Industrial Revolution. By 2000, the acidity will reach a level which will be higher than the 20 million years ago, making, the, making it completely inadaptable to many of the buried spaces that inhabit that space today. 
we are suddenly seeing an increase in the weather severity. Many of us in various parts of the world have experienced either increase in the number of the weather severity or in the magnitude of the weather severity events that we experience now. And this is likely to increase in the coming years as we have more weather events with devastating consequences both for life and property. We will see the migration of species and many of the marine species that inhabit the space today will be extinct in the coming years and they all have consequences in the maritime space. We are like to see explosions and leaks of hydrocarbons. The melting of the ice caps could lead to the leaks of, of explosions of hydrocarbons like gas and oil. The oil spills and the gas leaks or the shipping accidents pose tremendous risks to the marine ecosystems and many of these marine ecosystem losses that we will be experiencing will have grave consequences. So, having just given you a brief description of the changes that might come, which are all negative, what are the major implications that we are likely to see in the maritime space in the coming years? First of all, there will be tremendous loss to coastal infrastructure. And when I speak of coastal infrastructure, many of our coastal infrastructures are directly tied either to our economic infrastructure or to our energy infrastructure, or to our military infrastructure. All these key cases of infra infrastructure will have tremendous losses because many and most of these infrastructures are located close to the sea and the shorelines. The loss of the critical infrastructure will have impacts both on trade and the global economy. This could be increasing, could be leading to increasing property and hostile bilateral and multilateral relations. We will also have damage to offshore energy facilities that can adversely affect the energy security of our regions of the world. The maritime energy facilities like the offshore oil and gas well fields, floating gas terminals are expected to face substantial damage due to weather severity events and similarly many of the shore facilities will have the same kind of fate. We wish seeing the shrinking of the living marine resources and the marine resources like the fish resources can be affected by degradation of the marine space that they inhabit. In some cases, it will be affected by the food security of the several countries which depend on seafood for their diets. It will also affect the marine tourism and the reason I mentioned marine tourism is not only for social purposes but many countries in the world today depend on marine tourism as a backbone of the economy. So the decline in the marine tourism will also have an impact on those countries' economy and well-being. Countries like the Maldives, the Mauritius, for example, that will have tremendous adverse effects for this. There will be impacts, economic impacts on the coastal region as there will be immense economic impact on the coastal regions due to the decay of the maritime environment. It will result in increasing poverty. The number of people employed in maritime sector will have to move to new sectors and that will be difficult to have re-employment in many cases. We also foresee that there will be increase in maritime criminal activities for the reasons that as the maritime space becomes more difficult, there are more and more people being unemployed and more increase in property, there will be more people trying to have criminal activity for the well-being and the living. Therefore, the maritime space will experience more criminal activities in the coming years due to climate change impacts. We also like to see the spread of pandemics and epidemics due to a number of causes that are affected by the changing climate. Migration of pathogens and marine pathogens can affect people living in the coastal regions. And there will be other impacts of the changing climate of human body 
and the environment and the atmosphere that will can lead to either pandemics or epidemics. The changing climate will also have a changes in the geopolitics of marine, maritime geopolitics of the world. The melting of the ice caps in the north and the south will lead to the emergence of new trade routes. In the Arctic, the northern passage from, Ca from Canada will save two weeks of traveling time, for example, then went through the Panama Canal. But then and then, at the same time, this will also increase the geopolitics of competition as the new maritime routes open up. There will be effects on the visibility as changing environment and sediments due to extreme weather conditions will significantly affect the navigability of ships. Intense, unsafe ocean conditions and poor visibility for navigation could be another effect. Rise of temperature would result in the shortened lifespans of ships, again affecting on the economy of shipping. It could also have changes in the maritime boundaries as the sea level rise and as shores are lost to the sea, many of the baselines on which our maritime boundary has been based today or based on our laws will have to be revisited in a significant manner. And in many cases the changing boundaries of the maritime boundaries can affect not only the maritime stability of the maritime regime, it can also lead to conflicts and tensions. The unlaws that we have today does not cover many of the changes that we are about to face and for which we are completely unprepared. We could also see the complete disappearance of states. We will be having islands of the Pacific which will completely disappear. The state of Maldives will almost disappear or will completely disappear. So this will have grave social, economic, and international legal consequences. What will happen to the people who once inhabited those spaces? What is going to happen to the legal status of the waters on which they existed? What is the status of the easements which they once had? These, many of these questions will have to be answered as we have the cases of disappearance of states due to climate change. We will also have the politics of disaster management because as climate change breaks more severe and the, the frequency of disasters increase, many of the states will be unable to cope with the cha challenges of disaster management. In many cases, there will have to be international help or in some cases, international in interventions based on R2P. But those are all controversial cases and in many cases we could be seeing more conflict coming out of such cases of disaster management and the disputes. We will be having disputes over marine resources as the resources that are depleted and inefficient management could have consequences that could lead to disputes over resource management. There will be internal instabilities in many countries due to the impact, negative impact that the maritime space will bring to the local and international economy. The increase in the global poverty could lead to social instability, in many cases lead to internal and regional instability. We have seen the impacts of climate change that can bear have tremendous consequences on internal stability of countries as we saw in the Arab Spring leading to the Syrian civil war. And therefore, such consequences can also come from the maritime space. In the future scenario, as the time is short, I will be very brief, just highlight the headlines. There will be tremendous number of people who will be displaced. Migration is going to become the key point of displacement due to climate change, and in that, the maritime space will be a key sector to watch. We are unable to cope with a few thousand Syrian refugees. Imagine when countries disappear, we'll not only have a few thousands, we'll have hundreds of thousands. Bangladesh, I'm quoting from the National Strategy of Bangladesh Government and also from the IPCC's statements and reports. A 20% loss of Bangladesh during the sea due to sea level rise 
will create a 30 million refugees. We are not talking about hundreds of thousands, we are now talking of millions of refugees coming out of a single country. And for that, we are very, very ill prepared as an international community. We are also seeing the changing geopolitics of the Arctic, as I mentioned, the new routes will open up new avenues and opportunities. It will also open up new battlegrounds for strategic competition. We are seeing the possibilities of marine conflicts as new militarization takes place in some of the seas and new strategic competition begins in the Indian Ocean, for example, or as the US rebalances towards the Asia Pacific and the increase of resistance for the Chinese, many of this will bring up the possibilities of maritime conflicts. So what are my recommendations to finish the presentation? First of all, we need to revisit many of the rules and conventions of the international institutions on maritime and related issues to meet the new challenges that we will face, for which we are very ill-prepared. We need to establish proper frameworks on issues of migration and the extinction of disappearance of states due to climate change. We need to devote more national and international resources for marine protection and adaptation. We have to build resilience and capacity for HADR. We also have to maintain balance of power in the changing maritime geopolitical realities for which we are ill prepared again and we have to have new international understanding and regimes to do that. And finally, we need to build new international regimes for marine resource management under the climate change conditions. With that, I would only like to say at the end that we are entering uncharted waters. And these uncharted waters have grave consequences on our marine space, on our marine stability, on our marine economy, and our marine geopolitics. And for many of these causes that I highlighted, are caused by the changing climate, which we have not faced squarely, and for which, as an international community, we are still rather ill-prepared. Time is running out. It is high time that we take note of this, so that we are prepared to face the challenges and the changes that are coming in the maritime space. I thank you all for your patient participation. Thank you. speaker, I think, is going to address a topic that sits somewhere at the nexus of these two phenomena, both environmental stress and the uh, vagueness and sometimes inadequacy of our legal frameworks. Uh, Roger Baker is going to talk to us about illegal fiction and geopolitical consequences. Please, Roger. Quite an interesting set of topics in this conference so far, and, and looking forward to the rest of them. Um, what I'll be talking about really does seem to fall in between uh, these two aspects, and even the, the earlier discussion as well. I'm looking at the broader base, the structure of what's going on in the region. When we look at the Asia Pacific, we see it uh, as land surrounded by water. And you'll forgive me if I take my slides out of order. There aren't that many anyway, um, but we'll come back to those. Uh, when we look at the region, you have your populations, and your populations are all centered right around the coast. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the definition of the Asian Pacific, it is that space. Um, if you think about why people uh, from the start have gone to sea, uh, the first thing and the first reason they go to sea is for food, and then the second reason is for trade and then exploration and, and things of that sort. And food remains one of these primary aspects. Uh, frequently, when we look at South China Sea, a lot of the discussions are competition over maritime territory and the discussions center on ideas of uh, mineral resources, oil and gas resources, other types of subsea resources. But when you look at the actual exploitation of those resources, many of them are just right around the coastal areas. Um, it's not clear uh, that there really are uh, sort of the next uh, Saudi Arabia underneath the South China Sea. Um, but what there is is fish, uh, fish, crabs, clams, uh, seafood. Um, and this is uh, not only one of the driving uh, causes of instability in the region, 
but it's a major component of the economies. It's a major component of the food supplies uh, throughout the area. So if we look at um, the Asia Pacific right now, uh, in Asia, about 50% of the uh, maritime resources that they produce are consumed within the region. Uh, the rest are exported out of the region. Uh, so if you look at uh, numbers, uh, China right now exports about 21 billion in marine products. Uh, Vietnam, about 8 billion in marine products. Thailand, about 6.6 .6 billion. India, 5.6 billion in marine products a year. Uh, this is a fair amount of, of economic activity that's taking place. Uh, consumption of marine products in the region. Um, Asia, about between 8 and 20 percent of uh, protein intake in most Asian countries comes from the sea. Uh, if you want to compare that to Western countries, it's usually less than 5 percent. So it's a very significant component of what goes on in the region. 2 to 5 percent of uh, calories come from the sea. Uh, in the Asia Pacific, about 1 percent in Western countries. So even if Western countries may consume more fish per capita, it's a much bigger component of the significant elements of the food sources in these regions. So let's go back and look. Let's look at the region. So when we look at fishing in the Asia Pacific, uh, one of the things you'll notice is that many of the key species of fish in nearshore fishing uh, are overfished um, or fully fished. And if you go by the three definitions FAO uses, uh, depleted or overfished basically means that they are being fished at a level that's no longer sustainable um, and that you, you cannot keep the stocks up and the stocks are going to be completed. Uh, fully fished uh, refers to that they are just running right along at the edge of the sustainable level. If you significantly increase the catch, you're going to undermine that. If you have a change in the, in the way in which the ecosystems work, you're going to undermine that. And then you have the moderately or underfished. Um, if you were to go forward and look at other parts of the sea, okay, you're going to see very similar uh, in the Indian Ocean Basin that we have these same areas uh, where inshore most of the key species are either fully fished or now overfished. And this is the result of two different factors. One is a significant increase in the amount of catch that's taking place. More than 50% of the global catch takes place in the Asian Pacific, um, or by Asian countries. So there is a, a large increase in the amount of fish that they're catching, the amount of seafood. I'm, when I say fish, I'm meaning all sea products. So we'll, we'll take it at that. So we don't have to say fish and clams and crabs and squid. Um, but when, when we look at that, uh, a, a fairly substantial amount of catch, the more they catch nearshore, uh, the more you deplete the stocks near shore, the more that the fish are going to need to move further offshore. And the more they move further offshore, the more they start running into each other. And in a region where your maritime boundaries are less than well defined and less than well agreed upon, this becomes a very large source of contention. Um, if you think about uh, oil and gas resources and competition over in oil and gas resources. There's been very little actual military conflict in the Asia Pacific over there. If you think about fisheries resources, there's been a much higher level of competition and actual conflict and confrontation. If you take the two Koreas, uh, which are sitting there at the edge of the state of war at all times, uh, their maritime confrontations where they have sunk and, uh, each other's ships, um, killed each other's sailors, have been over crab fishing. So this becomes a very contentious level. Add in, how do you define where are uh, the fish and where they belong? So when we start looking at the idea of IUU fishing, um, illegal, uh, unregulated, unreported fishing, number one, how do you define what's illegal if each country has a different definition of where their border is and where their boundary is? So is traditional Chinese fishing in their traditional fishing grounds in the Tatuna Sea illegal or not? And that depends if you ask Indonesia, who is capturing the boats from China, from Malaysia, from Vietnam, and sinking them. Or if you ask these other countries who say, this is traditional ground, it's not illegal. If you look at um, unregulated and unreported fishing in the region, by some accounts, anywhere between 30 and 50% of fish uh, and, and maritime take is unreported. Um, unreported or misreported. 
So even the numbers that we start working off of in looking at the region and looking at the tank uh, is, is fairly misleading. And when we look at the growth in capture, it becomes fairly striking as you look at that. And as you look again at, at Asia holds uh, greater than 50% uh, of total capture, or right, just, just over 50% of total capture. Um, countries like China have seen a very large change in uh, their capture. Indonesia right now has one of the highest rates of growth and expansion of fish tank uh, within the region. And we're seeing then, as you look at the way in which this competition starts to play out over the resources, changes in the way in which the countries are related. In part, UNCLOS uh, sort of created in some of these countries a mindset of use it or lose it in the new expanded territories where they may be able to go. And so you saw that spur an acceleration of the exploitation of resources. Secondarily, you see environmental issues, whether that's the way in which they use their land resources, whether we look at um, uh, changes in coastal activity uh, that starts to undermine the spawning grounds and the breeding grounds and, and the, the areas where the small fish are able to grow. So you may have a, the take of fish in the ocean that is not necessarily the primary driver of the depletion of stocks, but instead the change in the coastal environment and the change in where those fish are able to, to uh, grow to size to be able to be utilized. Um, interestingly, if you go back through history, you're going to find that there have been uh, competitions and near wars over fish throughout the region, um, over fishing stocks, over where it is. There's old croaker wars you can go back to, really interesting watching uh, how this has played out over time. So what we get to is the question of the complications. What do you do and how do you regulate it? Number one, by its very nature, um, unregulated fishing is unregulated. So that puts us at a very, very difficult point, right? Um, how do you regulate this? Well, if you think about the size of the fishing fleets in the South China Sea, they figure there's 1.7 million fishing vessels. Um, in Asia alone, it's somewhere around uh, 3, 3.5 million fishing vessels uh, in Asia. Um, of that, about a third are not under power. They're under sail or oar. So, Many of these, uh, and, and I think more than half or more than 60% are actually very small vessels, even the ones under power. So large numbers of the vessels are not even being uh, tagged, not even being marked, not reporting anything in their catches. Second, where they land uh, their fish, they may not report it. Um, it can move anywhere that it wants to. Uh, third, a lot of species are being fished that are not necessarily legal by different standards, depending on where you're going, or the methodology that they're using is not necessarily legal. Um, an interesting challenge that uh, the South Koreans have had is the use of uh, uh, finer mesh nets by some of the illegal Chinese fishing that moves into the South Korean waters, particularly around the northern limit lines. So the Chinese have, or the South Koreans have come up with a new uh, kind of concept to deal with that. They're starting to sink large artificial reefs uh, that have blades on them. So it's, a, it's a creative way to create a barbed wire fence underwater that hopefully catches this and starts to, starts to break up. Um, but even with these types of, of reef structures, you can only place them in limited areas. So the third factor that we look at as we're looking at this is the change in uh, the sense of nationalism and the sense of economic activity that's going on throughout the region. So as we discussed earlier, when you look at Chinese maritime expansion, Chinese maritime expansion is a fundamental change based on trade patterns. It's put the Chinese into waters where they haven't been uh, traditionally. That's changing the way in which other countries respond to that. Um, we see uh, Indonesia now starting to expand its maritime activity. Uh, the Philippines has tried to start asserting its maritime space. Uh, Taiwan, um, throughout the region, you start to see this. Thailand probably is the only one that was reducing for a while, particularly in fisheries. Um, Vietnam is expanding. Uh, Third-party countries are starting to come into the region. Uh, the Vietnamese are inviting the French in. The Americans are there. Uh, you see the Japanese moving into the South China Sea and into the Indian Ocean. You see the Indians moving up into the South China Sea. So this becomes a very complicated place where national boundaries and maritime resources start to overlap. When we look then at the activity of fishing fleets, Fishing fleets are both exploited by and able to exploit nationalism and government assertions of maritime competition and maritime claims. 
So we've seen many times where you'll see large fishing fleets from countries adorned with flags and, and nationalist slogans on the side move out into a space uh, to assert national territoriality, sometimes with the backing of the government, sometimes not. One of the other challenges of these fleets when we start getting into the question of unregulated is many of these fishing fleets will then move into a space that they know is not within their national territory, but they will do so because they will assume that because of the nationalist assertions by their government, their government will back them up and bail them out of this problem. So what are the challenges and how do we come to any solutions in the region? Well, one of the first problems is that this is something that is not just able to be resolved in a bilateral manner. Um, you can't just make a fishing agreement with two countries. Uh, sometimes you can. So one of the more successful arrangements that we've seen uh, is in the Gulf of Tonkin between Vietnam and China. Uh, and it's one of the few places in the region where you see a fairly successful arrangement, but that's because it's a fairly constra constrained space. Um, other cooperation agreements haven't quite worked. Um, it deals with national sovereignty, uh, which as we will currently the law is very complicated and, and we're not going to have resolutions anytime in the near future. Uh, it deals with ecology. In other words, fish don't respect borders. Um, and that's just the reality of it. They're going to go where they're going to go, and what are you going to do about it? Um, it deals also, when you're thinking about ecology, with the type of fish that you take. So if you take the small fish or the large fish not able going to feed on them, if you have a decrease in the large fish, then you start taking more of the small fish or the trash fish. Uh, that starts to reduce the ability of the large fish stocks to restock. So what you end up needing is a very comprehensive mechanism. Yet many of the UN op mechanisms that we've seen are the mechanisms on the sideline that are multilateral that attempt to be a combination of ecological, uh, political, and security really aren't holding. And that's because in the end, we're pulling back to national self-interest. And national self-interest, um, both in the, the direct actions of the nations, but also in looking at these aspects of, of the illegal aspects and the unreported aspects, uh, still plays a fairly strong role uh, in the region and in what we're looking at. So I guess as we, as we look at the, the not-so-complicated map when we step back from it, um, one of the final things that, that I think we can, we can leave with is that this is not an issue that's going to go away anytime soon, and it's an issue that's very real. Again, there's a lot of attention on oil and gas, there's a lot of attention on subsea mineral resources, um, uh, methane hydrates, uh, mineral nodules, all sorts of things that go on. But very real and right now is an issue of fishing. And it's an issue that uh, in many cases, is outside the realm of the governments to regulate and manage their fishing fleets, particularly as you look at the size of some of these fleets, uh, the smallness of the ships, the large groupings of them, and the fact that this is playing off of very local uh, political aspects that keep these fish going to sea. And I hope we'll leave it there. phenomenon, which is the amazingly rapid development of Asia, an optimistic forward-looking Asia, and the challenges of accommodating this new Asia to existing realities, either established legal frameworks, the carrying capacity limits of the planet, and uh, coastal community practices, how does the new and the old mingle together. So we have about uh, 25 minutes for questions for our panelists. Um, I will ask those who are interested in asking a question, please introduce yourself and uh, specify to whom you'd like to address your question. We do have a microphone in the middle aisle here. We'll ask you to make use of. And for our panelists, there are two microphones there on the, on the table. Who would like to ask the first question of our speakers? Please, sir. Uh, it's at the back, but sir, if you, uh, if you can project, I'm sure that you can use with my Navy for Nancy Policy, Concept Development and International Cooperation. So first of all, uh, thank you very much for these uh, enlightened presentations. Uh, 
these were rather pessimistic under such an optimistic start by Admiral McDonald's. But uh, perhaps uh, these predictions were realistic as well. Uh, my opinion is uh, that if overpopulation can be stopped, uh, there will be not millions, but billions looking for a better life. And uh, we have not only the challenges in the, in the Far East, you have them also in Africa, crossing the Mediterranean. So a uh, question uh, for, to, uh, to General Muni Rutsaman, a very uh, difficult name, the, the Bangladesh general, that's easier for me. Uh, how do you estimate uh, your recommendations at the end uh, of your pessimistic presentation? How do you estimate the recommendations coming through and being heard by the politicians? I think it's uh, five minutes past 12.
is can be a good version to move beyond those talking points like I was saying. So uh, I'm not saying that the instrumental roles of the law, using the law as a tool, there are times that is actually a positive thing, and I'm not saying the US, when they, the US uses law as positive and when other, some other country uses it's negative. But I'm saying certain things like uh, when two nations enter a security alliance, that's that a positive thing. When nations enter a, a logistics agreement so their navies can cooperate, uh, that's a positive thing. Those are using the law as a tool. But when the law is manipulated and taken out of context, or its ordinary meaning is ignored, or when you use the phrase double standard, when a nation behaves one way in one location and another way in a different location in the world, then nations should be called out for that. And I don't just say uh, some other nation. I'm saying that all nations, including the United States. So. Thank you. Rob. Thank you very much, uh, Rob Hubert from the University of Calgary. Uh, thank you for a very good presentation. My question relates, uh, we'll start with Carrie, but I'd be interested on the other three panelists of your view. Uh, the one issue we haven't really talked about is governance, at least at the individual state level. I'm just wondering your views in terms of addressing these multiple of efforts in terms of what it means in terms of the specificality of governance. Now, what do I mean by that? When we look at the issue within some of the problems that we criticize in terms of the democratic outcomes, be it the British outcome of the Green ex Columbia with the peace accord or even the American election, there are obviously issues that are at hand. But as Kerry brought up so well in terms of China, of course, underlining China's success, it is functioning under an authoritative governance system. So I'm just wondering in terms of the complexity of what we're seeing in terms of these various models of how we are ultimately going to be making decisions to respond to these problems, how you see the different type of governance regimes that are at the state level, how does that overplay on the challenges that each of you brought forward? Thanks, Rob. A very uh, ambitious question. Thank you for keeping us on our toes. Um, well, I think that was first for me. So uh, I'll start by saying that I appreciate your use of the word governance, which I think is appropriately broad to be applied to the Asian continent. The one thing that we can say about Asia is that it's incredibly diverse in lots of different ways, but certainly in terms of its political character. And there's definitely a lot of uh, interesting and I think justified research that suggests that um, some of the capital intensive investments that were responsible for Asia's maritime rise in the way that I described it were enabled by um, governments that could mobilize a large degree of capital for long-term investment, something that's pretty hard to do when you have short election cycles, as uh, Canadians know well and a lot of Westerners know well. Um, so certainly there has been a role to play for those strong governments that we saw in the immediate post-war period, for better or worse. There are certainly disadvantages to that kind of political structure, which we know well, but in terms of just sheer economic investment and redirection of economies to become more Western-focused and enmeshed with um, new economic partners, it, was, it had a big part to play. Um, so I think that diversity across Asia in terms of forms of government will continue to be a reality. And one of the things that will be a make or break factor both in, in terms of how we govern the seas, not just with reference to UNCLOS, but also with reference to a huge number of instruments under the IMO and the bilateral frameworks for management of resources or regulation of trade. Um, a lot of the tests will be, can we create governance frameworks that can be used comfortably inside a region so politically diverse? Because where cooperation and coordination has been most successful is where partners have been willing and able to accommodate each other's domestic differences. And I, I don't see that changing. I don't think we'll ever see, and I'm not sure we should want to see a homogenous in Asia. That's really for the peoples of Asia to decide themselves. But I do think uh, for those of us like Canada and the United States that seek to engage Asia, Asia, we need to be looking for frameworks that are flexible enough to be able to accommodate diversity in the partnership and yet firm enough to be able to regulate and provide stability and order. So far we've done it, but we're clearly in seeing lots of areas of stress. Um, I'll invite some of the other panelists to comment. I think that uh, one of the critical things is uh, 
the opportunity and the efforts to understand different perspectives and to engage. And so while each nation's domestic system of government might be different, I think that every opportunity for our militaries to engage is a good thing. You know, I think that a lot of the dialogues, both official and unofficial, that I've attended in my Navy career, uh, you know, we do some sort of dinner. Uh, if we do a dinner the night before the talks can start, it dials down the any kind of friction or tension on the first day of the talks because you've started getting to know that person as a human being, right? And I think that uh, you know, while each nation might have a different system of government. We each have a military. We each have a Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so we do, do have certain kind of common channels. And you know, one of the things that the Asian Pacific Center that we pride ourselves on is uh, that opportunity for individuals to engage. And you know, when you put somebody in a course for six weeks, as opposed to a one-day official exchange of views, they get to know each other as individuals. And we see that with a lot of the subject matter exchanges that your navies do, with our navies each other and, and so as a result it doesn't mean that we're going to agree with each other but I think the first critical step is to understand each other's perspectives and, and develop some sort of common understanding not a consensus but a common understanding in terms of the global governance relation in relation to the climate change impacts my take on this is that perhaps uh, there is a conflict between the system of governance that we have built for ourselves or are used to and living with the consequences of climate change. Because the uh, issues of climate change are not country specific in impacts. They have a much larger canvas. And they need not only a single country or a region, but a complete global response and a governance response to many of the challenges. And in many cases, the West Valley state system on base of which we govern ourselves are perhaps a conflict in many of the challenges of climate change. And we need to revisit some of the international responses as an international community, how we can meet those challenges of impacts of climate change. And the issues of transboundary water, the potential movement of people due to the displacement, because in most cases, climate change does not recognize international boundaries. So therefore, we perhaps have to rethink and revisit some of the issues of global governance. Just briefly, I would add that um, you know, in addition to the, the understanding what each other country, uh, how they see things, um, or looking at the difference, understanding differences, it's maybe being able to focus on a very specific element of an issue uh, where you can agree that there are common norms and common understanding on that issue, and accept that on everything else you're going to disagree, but make sure that on that one issue, all of the other disagreements don't go into it. So you don't, if you're if you're working on an issue on fishing or on, on a boundary or, or anything like that, you don't also have to have a simultaneous discussion on human rights or economic domination. Um, there are ways maybe to tease out some of these subsets, uh, at least at, at certain stages, um, and later work towards that broader uh, help. Sir, please. Hello. Boston Bogarty, Ambassador Victorian Canada. Uh, Professor, you outlined how nations in Asia use the excess through the maritime domain to the American and Western European markets to leverage cheap manual labor based manufacturing to graduate from have not yet to have to advanced economies. But the key to this was that the cheap manufacturing, the cheap manual manufacturing labor enabled them to rise out of uh, abject poverty, to be honest. The problem is, I think, that this technological window is closing. We had uh, developments this year with um, well publicized speed factories of Adidas, a shoe manufacturing company, and Nike and others are following. Their manufacturing is coming back as high tech, low manual impact manufacturing to the best to Western Europe to America and this opens up the potential if it extends to textile manufacturing and so on to close down that economic window of opportunity that 
cheap manual, manual labor-based manufacturing which countries like Taiwan, like South Korea, and initially even Japan used to rise to the industrial nations they are now today. So the, the, the optimistic outlook was we have haves and have not yet. Might we in future have again haves and have nots and will continue between the two. Yeah, that's an excellent observation in the sense that the Asian experience is not necessarily translatable to those that haven't yet um, reached that level of development. Absolutely. Um, I think that it still, however, explains a great deal of what we see in contemporary Asia. And it's hard to imagine that even as we move towards high-tech manufacturing, that the established economies of Asia won't play an important role. So um, it's long since been true that Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan are no longer reliant on cheap labor. In fact, labor is not all that cheap in those places anymore. Um, and they're important drivers in this innovative economy. And um, so they will find new roles to play along with European and Western partners, no doubt. But I think the point that you're making, that this model may not be translatable for the next century to those new, not so uh, enmeshed parts of the global economy, like in South Asia, for example, uh, is well taken and should be forgotten. I think, Jim, you had a question or a comment? Well, uh, both. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, I'd like to commend all the presenters on their uh, presentations. It strikes me that we're looking at two vectors, one which is rising one is the speed of climate change, and the other is the diminution of natural resources. And in your IUU presentation, Roger, the larger decline of fisheries globally, your slides demonstrated areas, an increasing number of areas in the South China Sea, somewhat lesser in the Indian Ocean, of fish to the maximum or beyond. And uh, our colleague, uh, Boris Verm at Dalhousie University in Halifax, published several years ago a deeply pessimistic analysis that showed global fish loss time to spend in the century almost as wide as security. And what I think strikes me is that I don't think perhaps the bills of the recreation that all I don't feel that sense of dramatic urgency. Is local, 
And they really do have their domestic constituencies and their immediate issues that they have to deal with. And you see this repeated over and over again. Um, and I don't know that there is an elegant way to get past uh, that aspect of, of reality, pessimistic as it may sound. Part of the answer, though, has to be, and I don't know if there's any um, contrary view that you guys want to share, but um, I think part of the answer has to be that we can't be looking for civil bullet solutions or the, the perfect 100-year plan. I mean, even uh, whether you're talking about the most populist democratic government or the least populist de democratic government, I don't think either f framework is very good for 100-year plans. Um, but we need to be looking for real and now tangible wins that usually are less sexy, certainly perhaps room for less optimism in the big picture of things, but it's really the only way to start momentum on these really daunting and large-scale global challenges. To make the global local is how governments start to make progress. No, I also think, Jim, that this is also a conflict of cycles, because uh, our political masters work in five-year cycles, and that is the attention span for them to the next elections. And beyond that, it is somebody else's problem. But here we are dealing with a problem which is much beyond the five-year cycles. These are civilizational problems. Perhaps the future of that global humanity depends on it. But we understand that. But there is nobody in charge to implement policies which are beyond the five or ten-year cycles.